I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Glomic, uh, Dominic Glover today. Uh, Dominic is a research fellow at the Institute for Development Studies, and he's got an amazingly transdisciplinary background, having done his first degree in law, followed by an MA in international political uh, economy, and a PhD on the role of transnational biotechnology companies uh, on, in the development and commercialization of transgenic crops in developing countries. Uh, and that's really launched his interest in research policy and governance and knowledge systems and the processes by which technological change happens. He's now working on an interdisciplinary research program on the spread of rice cultivation system uh, called the system of rice intensification, which is a really fascinating example of uh, technological change happening from the ground up. So really from the grassroots in the literal sense. Uh, and he's also working on uh, a couple of new research projects uh, on Indian seed companies that are entering the African seed market uh, and on the potential uh, for broadening the use of insects in global food systems. Uh, so I'll hand over to uh, Dominic. And as we've just said, if you have uh, any questions, you can pop them in the chat and I'll collate them for the uh, points in the talk when we'll have uh, discussions. Or of course, you can ask them at the end. Over to you. Great, thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen. I hope uh, that you can see that now. Uh, Peter, could you give me a thumbs up to make sure you can see that? Great, thanks. All right, so let me begin. Thank you very much to the uh, NISD for this invitation to come and speak to you today. And thank you everyone for taking the time uh, to come and uh, hear this presentation. My topic today, my title is Beyond Adoption, Understanding Technological Change in Smallholder Agriculture. I'm going to be talking about the theory of affordances and how it can be used to think about the implications of technology and technological change for different people and communities uh, in agriculture. Um, I'm going to be talking about technography and a technographic understanding of technology as a kind of practice and I'm going to be talking about a proposal uh, made by myself and some other colleagues uh, about a new conceptual framework for thinking about technological change and how it might be applied to smallholder agriculture. And I'm going to end with uh, some reflections on what it would take to operationalize that new conceptual framework um, and how it might be used operationally, both to design and to implement and to evaluate uh, um, innovations and, and uh, the uh, appropriateness, the accessibility, the utility of, of technologies and technological change for different people and groups, and how it might help us to steer um, towards desired futures and avoid uh, negative outcomes. Okay, so let me begin by uh, I've divided my presentation into three sections and I'm going to um, uh, pause in between. I'll be begin by talking about what I'm talking about when I talk about um, technology. So in casual conversation, technology very often means something like a device, a gadget or a machine. Um, and also it tends to be used in popular discourse for something modern, something new, which is high tech and it includes things like artificial intelligence, biotechnology, nanotechnology, 3D printing, biotech, uh, drones and robots, uh, sophisticated techniques of modern engineering. But I think we need to attend much more to some rather humdrum technologies, including technologies that are so everyday and familiar that we tend to overlook them. And I'm going to talk about the example of a pencil. So if you think about a pencil sitting on a table, unless and until somebody picks up that object, uh, it is just an object. It's just a cylinder of wood that encloses a stick of graphite. And if you had a, the famous visitor from the planet Mars, they might not know instantly how this object could be used or what it could be used for. But human children uh, learn quite early in life that you can use this object to, uh, to make marks on a piece of paper, for example. And the pencil works really well for this application. Uh, if it's used on a flat surface that has just the right amount of resistance and smoothness and roughness, um, such as a sheet of pale colored paper, which is resting on a surface such as a table. But a pencil doesn't work so well for making marks on a rough surface, such as a brick. It's not very good at making marks on a smooth surface like glass. 
and it can't be used to make any marks on the surface of water, for example. And we might say that a pencil is supposed to be used for writing and drawing, but it turns out that we can also use it in other ways and for other things. We could use it to pierce, we could use it to stab, we could use it to gouge or to flick, we could use it to drum uh, on the edge of the table, we could use it to suck on while we're thinking, uh, we can use it to retrieve something that's fallen underneath a heavy dresser. And in all of these situations, a pencil can be used and manipulated in various different ways, uh, with more or less skill and finesse, with playfulness or with violence or whatever. And what's interesting about this pencil is if you and I both pick it up and write something with it, <laughs> it turns out that your handwriting is so different from mine that we can tell who's written which statement. And it can be identified almost uniquely as yours or mine. So you can use a pencil to leave behind a trace that continues to influence others even when you're no longer present. So what does this example illustrate about technology? Two critically important points. First, the user matters at least as much as the object that he or she puts to use because it's the object only becomes a tool when it is picked up and put into use. And outside those moments, all you have are objects that have potential uses as, as tools. So from this perspective, technology is not a pre-existing entity uh, that people possess or that they lack. It's something that they do or that they make. It's part of a creative act. It's human agency that makes these objects into tools and so creates technology. Second point, when objects are used as tools, they not only allow their users to manipulate the material world, they can also create connections between different social actors, between the users and other people, including anybody who is affected by the way that tool is employed. And this is interesting when you think about objects that are designed rather than just objects that you might find in the natural environment. Designed objects create connections between their designers and their users or their owners and their users. So the users might take up and use those objects in ways that the designer has intended or anticipated, but sometimes they use them in ways that the designer hasn't thought of and perhaps even disapproves of. So in thinking about technology and talking about technology, I'm not talking about gadgets, devices and machines, but I'm talking about practices or techniques. And I'm talking about purposeful action, intentional action by individuals and not only individuals, also groups, which you might call task groups. I'm talking about the use of knowledge and bodily skill and techniques and tools and instruments of various kinds. And in agriculture, famously, this includes living organisms. And I'm talking about um, practices that are enabled and constrained by the material world. So this is a realist approach and also by cultural routines. And I'm talking about coordinated action, the assembly and choreography of resources in time and space. So it's a very human activity. And let me summarize that even one step further. Basically, when I'm talking about technology, I'm talking about practices and relationships. Those are two key things that make up technology. And by practices, I'm talking about skills, knowledge, techniques, routines. And in relationships, I'm talking about connections, interactions, exchanges and I'll elaborate on those points. So <clears throat> what has this got to do with agriculture? Well, agriculture itself is a technology when viewed from this perspective. It's the use of an array of tools, including living organisms and techniques to build a livelihood from the land. And it means conceptualizing or conceiving farmers as technological practitioners, as skilled agents and decision makers, and people who are socially and culturally embedded uh, embedded in certain kinds of institutional um, structures and settings. And by the way, when I say that farmers are skilled, I'm not necessarily saying that farmers are always skillful. So uh, this isn't a sort of an essentializing argument about farmers' in innate wisdom. My uh, way into thinking about uh, technology from this point of view came from um, learning that uh, the word technology in French apparently doesn't mean uh, uh, gadgets and devices in the same way as it generally does in English. It means the study of or the knowledge about tools and practices and techniques. In other words, <clears throat> technology is to technique as sociology is to society, 
as musicology as to music or as linguistics as to language. Sorry, excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of water. <clears throat> in other words, in this, in, in, certainly in French, technology is not the thing itself, but its study, its theory, its concepts, its associated body of knowledge. And it's been called a human science, a field within a social sciences, a branch of anthropology, which is definitely not the way most people in uh, uh, Anglophone countries think of technology. And this comes from reading the work of Francois Sigaud, who was an interesting guy, actually a development agronomist and a museologist and an anthropologist, now deceased. <coughs> so in English, of course, the word technology doesn't quite mean those things. And so people have resorted to an alternative language of technography. And um, in this, I've been inspired by the time that I spent in Wageningen University as a postdoc for six years, working with what was originally, uh, the time I joined it was the Technology and Agrarian Development Group and later became the Knowledge, Technology and Innovation Group. Uh, when I first joined, it was led by the anthropologist Paul Richards. And later it was combined with the um, uh, Communication and Innovation Studies Group under the leadership of Case Lewis. And uh, part of the, uh, the kind of festschrift that we did for Paul Richards when he, was, when he retired was to write a special issue of the, um, uh, the Enyas Wageningen Journal of, uh, of Life Sciences, um, talking about technography. And two of my then colleagues, uh, Casey Anson and Asitza Velema, wrote a nice paper about what technography is. They're not the only people who've written about it, but they uh, said that technography as a, as a methodology and a conceptual framework for thinking about technology has these three components as shown on the slide. So when I'm talking about technology, I'm using the term to mean not only technical systems and tools and artifacts, but also techniques, practices, institutional cultures and forms of organization that are involved with the deployment and use of those systems and tools and artifacts. And this is what we mean by technographic understanding. And it's associated with the ethnographic scholarship of people such as Marcel Mauss, Francois Sigaud, Paul Richards, and a variety of others that I could name. So through a technographic lens, technology is viewed as a domain of technical practices in which tools and techniques are deployed purposefully to transform materials and thereby to achieve human social objectives. And it, includes these three components. First one is making or doing. And it's about the use of techniques and it's about the transformation of materials, what is being made and also why that's being done. So what are the purposes? And it's about the work of individuals, but also task groups. And bearing in mind that task groups might be people in the same time and space doing a task alongside one another. But if they're linked together through a series of operations, for example, over the course of an agricultural season, or over a, a large space, such as people involved in, a, in an agricultural value chain, then those task groups might be distributed in time and space in ways that make it important to understand how those people are connected together socially and also how they're linked together by technical protocols and by tools and devices. So uh, the study of this means looking at who's involved, the roles that are being performed, the division of labor and so on. So that's component number one, making. The second one, distributed cognition. There's an interesting literature on how carrying out tasks uh, has a, an ordering uh, effect on uh, how people organize themselves, how they communicate together, how hierarchies emerge, how specialism emerges, how communication happens, and how information is unevenly distributed through a task group. Uh, and there's a coordination of tasks in time and space, which means that if you have different people contributing in different ways to one overarching operation, you'll get effects such as specialism or specialization. You'll get effects such as some people knowing, some people having a very small uh, um, perception of the whole system and some people having an overview of the whole system. And it's through the kind of logic of carrying out the task that these social effects are felt. A couple of key works that have been really informative uh, in the Wageningen group and in my understanding of what this is all about are Edwin Hutchins' book Cognition in the Wild, uh, which uh, has just fascinating descriptions of how a large ship is piloted, and Tom McFeet's work on small group cultures, which is about how 
uh, small groups form and also what happens when membership of groups changes and when you get one cohort succeeding uh, another cohort to, to carry out the same task, how the task changes and how the group changes. The third part is about the construction of rules uh, that emerge from the carrying out of the task. So as these specialisms emerge and as uh, information and uh, uh, which is often associated with power is distributed unevenly, you get protocols, you get norms, you get routines, you get rituals and symbols that emerge. And uh, this is associated with the specialization of tasks and the associations that are based on skills, which from the Latin is, uh, has been called sodality, from the Latin sodales, which means brotherhood. And we're talking here about guilds, professional associations, trades unions, secret societies, cults. And these are uh, human institutions that have um, um, traditions of apprenticeship and certain kind of initiation ceremonies and ways of recognizing people's credentials as being uh, a skilled uh, initiate or being a master and so on. So that's a little bit about a technographic approach. And in a way, as I've explained, that is a sort of an, an anglicized way, I think, of understanding uh, how the French think about technology just because of the different way that language has evolved. So I think that probably is a good place to pause just in case there are any questions at this stage. Because I realize that some of that is rather esoteric. Uh, Dominic, I was wondering whether you could give an example for uh, where this understanding of technology would really change your view of, uh, for example, how, uh, how an agricultural policy should be designed, like where would this understanding of technology in, in uh, with many complexities and with a uh, yeah with something far more than just a device change how uh, something should be designed to make it better for farmers or uh, in terms of organizational rules or in terms of mm. uh, policy rather than just uh, mm. a thing. Mm. Yeah, I, I hope that, uh, that that's going to become clear in the remainder of the presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk in the next section about affordances, but I'm also going to talk, uh, for example, about the difference which, I, which, which we tried to bring when we, when we studied the system of rice intensification, about the difference it made to our uh, research methodology. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I want to talk about um, how this alternative kind of conceptualization of technology and technological change could actually be applied in three different areas, um, both in the design and conceptualization of we're going to make an intervention here, but how are we going to design it? And in how the implementation is done, um, for example, who are you going to target? How are you going to engage with them? And also in the evaluation of what's happened. Um, the key thing, which I'll trail in advance, is that I think certainly as far as evaluation is concerned, it's important to let go of the idea that what you're promoting is a technology package where you have a very a strong preconception about what the outcome state is supposed to be or what the, expect, the expected mm -hmm. final state is. Um, because things can change on the ground in ways that you haven't anticipated. And, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't achieving some good, um, but you might also be doing some harm if you're not aware of those things. So in those three domains, but I will be coming to those um, thoughts uh, yeah, later in the presentation. Uh, well, if we don't have any questions coming up now, then- Can I, can I come in? Is that all right? Yeah. Um, hi, Dominic. Yeah, fascinating. Oh, there's one in there as well. Can, um, maybe I'll just quickly ask while I'm on the mic, could you back, go back a slide quickly, just so I can get my, um, my wording correctly? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. So these, yeah, I'm interested in this construction of the rules. Um, around, you know, the guilds and groups are already there, probably have different um, degrees of power and control around how the technology is designed. So that's, is it the idea that the these groups are structured around the technology or more that they are restructuring the technology to suit their own kind of um, mm. uh, aims and needs? Mm. Uh, that's a really good question. I think, um... The point I was trying to draw attention to here, I think, is well illustrated um, by 
the uh, an example which uh, I'm, so I'm actually working on a paper where I've been working on it for, well so I've, I've had a paper sitting on the back burner for months now where I really need to get it finished which is basically what this presentation is about and in there I talk about the example of um, a whale hunt in fact I have written about this in, in another paper together with Sora Barora um, where the exigencies of the task and the logic of how the task has to be performed um, end up uh, distributing information and, and skills uh, in an uneven way. So that in a whale boat, for example, this, we're talking about traditional whaling in a, in a rowing boat, you have the engine is a large number of uh, big blokes who are powering this boat through the waves, but they all have their back to the whale they can't actually see what's going on. Then you have the steersman who's at the back of the boat, uh, who is the only person in the boat who can see everything that's going on. They can, he can see the, uh, the, the, uh, the oarsmen, he can see the whale, he can see the harpooner. Uh, he knows where the other boats are. He knows where they are in relation to the ship. He, he, that person has the overview of what is going on. And then at the front, you've got the harpooner. And of course the harpooner is absolutely crucial because without that person, you know, the whale hunt is gonna fail but they've got their back to the rest of the boat and uh, they're staring out ahead of the boat uh, towards the whale. They're relying entirely on the steersman and the, the, uh, the engine room to get them there. Um, but finally, it's up to them with their skill and dexterity to kind of thrust the harpoon at just the right moment and the right angle with the right force in order to uh, stab the whale. Um, so I think it's a nice illustration because it just shows how the, the, the task itself is kind of creating this ordering of, of the tasks that have to be performed and the number of people involved in them, but also a kind of distribution of who knows what's going on and what parts of the operation they have under their control. And so out of this, you know, over a period of time, you get that, you know, the harpoonist uh, is, is a, a, a sort of special character. They're like the, um, they're like the, uh, the, the, the pilots in Top Gun, you know, they are uh, the, um, they're the, 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 the extreme specialists on board the ship and they get special privileges because they're so important. Uh, whereas if you're just one of, you know, 15 or 20 blokes who are, who are pulling the oil, you're, you're pretty interchangeable with someone else who can do the same thing that you can. Um, there were a couple of interesting studies in Bakening while I was there. Uh, one in particular was um, done through videoing um, how uh, masters and apprentices uh, interact in a place called Swami Magazine, um, which is uh, on the edge of uh, Kumasi, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, it's a place where it's this extraordinary landscape where there's a, a whole load of people who, who are mechanics and repair cars and mend cars and strip parts off cars and supply their spare parts. And uh, just seeing how, the, how you become a master and how the apprentices are trained at the feet of the master, almost literally at the feet of the master to take over and, and to learn these skills. So that's all about how these tasks are ordered and how power accumulates to certain people. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have one question that's come up in the chat from John McDonough uh, asking, uh, Oh, I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, that's very interesting that you uh, that you describe the technology as having including the thing and the user and the way it is used. Uh, but would you say that there are some technologies where the the balance is more towards the thing? Uh, and John mentions pesticides or vaccines, and others like the pencil, where uh, the balance of the technology is more towards the user because the user has min much more input in how it's used in tort ends. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I'm going to sort of duck out of it by saying, I think that's something that has to be discovered empirically. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm confident in stating mm. that you, that there are certain characteristics of technical artifacts that you could confidently say ex ante, you know, that uh, um, the, the artifact is more important. But I think there's, there's something interesting about the complexity, about the, the, the esoteric knowledge that's needed, and also about risk and danger. 
Mm. Um, so, you know, pesticides are intrinsically potentially dangerous. And so, for example, is a nuclear power station. And you need highly specialized uh, and rather esoteric knowledge to really understand what's going on inside a nuclear uh, uh, power plant, for example. Um, so yeah, but I think yeah, you've got to you've got to find out these things empirically because, as I said, in in that part of the talk, um, the the point is that some of these artifacts can be used in ways that the designers uh, uh, don't intend and haven't anticipated, or maybe even that they've tried to exclude. So, for example, pesticides, very sadly, are used sometimes for suicide, which is not what they're designed for, but they're very effective. Okay, shall we move on to the section? Sure. Okay, so let me move on to affordances. Okay. So just let me say uh, to begin with that my approach to the concept of affordances has been inspired by and informed by scholars working in uh, anthropology and sociology of technology, including people like Bruno Latour, Michel Caillon, Brian Pfaffenberger, uh, Alan Costal, Francois Sigaud, Ian Hutchby, Tim Ingold, Tim Dant. And another really valuable source is a nice paper by uh, Andreas Garantino in the Philosophy of Science journal called Affordances Explained. But I think perhaps the most concise and accessible overview of affordances, which are applied as a principle in design, can be found in Don Norman's book, uh, The Design of Everyday Things, which is quite well known. It may be known to some of you in the meeting. So what are affordances? The theory of affordances is essentially a relational theory of perception. And it's specifically a theory about how animals interpret sensory information from the environment that surrounds them. And they discern opportunities within that environment or threats within that environment. So the theory was developed originally by James Gibson, an ecological psychologist, and he explained, as it says on the slide, the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal, uh, what it provides or furnishes, either for good or ill. And he coined the term affordance to help describe how animals relate to their surroundings. And he argued that a new term was needed because he said it encompassed both the environment and the animal in a way that no existing term does. It implies the complementarity of the animal and the environment. And that word complementarity will come back in a moment or two. So I think this, I, my experience when talking about affordances is uh, that people are sometimes um, a bit discombobulated by the term affordance, but uh, there is a, that, uh, a very normal, albeit not a very common word that we use the term to afford. We say, for example, this, occasion affords me the opportunity to tell you about some of the things that I've been working on. Uh, it might not be common and everyday speech, it might not be vernacular speech, but uh, that's basically where the word affordance comes from. So some other uh, ideas about um, what affordances are from a variety of different authors. So an affordance is a perceived property of an artifact that suggests how it should be used. That's Brian Pfaffenberger. Affordances are functional and relational aspects which frame, while not determining, the possibilities for agentic action in relation to an object. That's Ian Hutchby. And if you can get over the jargon of agentic action, I think it's quite helpful. Tim Ingold said, the concept of affordance refers to the properties of an object that render it apt for the project of a subject. And Don Norman, said an affordance is a relationship between the properties of an object and the capabilities of the agent that determine just how the object could possibly be used. So this concept of affordance has been taken up after Gibson by scholars in various fields, including product design, uh, for example, the design of user interfaces or human-centered design or ergonomics. It's been taken up by in uh, computing and information systems such as user interface design, organization studies, the philosophy of science, and the anthropology and sociology of technology. And uh, these examples, I think, include a range of those um, different uh, scholars from a range of those different fields. But I think if those are a bit uh, alienating, this one I think is quite neat. 
Uh, Alan Costell uh, gives this rather kind of uh, intuitive and accessible way to convey what affordances are. He says, we can see, for example, that something can be eaten or thrown. So it's a perception that there's an object there which is suitable for eating or suitable for being thrown for some purpose. So let's delve a little bit deeper into what's involved in these affordances. So according to Gibson, the affordances of eating or throwing exist within the potential for material interaction between two entities. There has to be some compatibility in that interaction between an object that is capable of being eaten or capable of being thrown and an organism that is capable of eating that object or throwing that object. So Gibson explained that to be graspable, an object must have opposite surfaces separated by a distance less than the span of the hand, which I think is quite a nice way of expressing the compatibility between a hand that can grasp and an object which is the right size and the right weight and the right uh, um, is accessible enough to be grasped. And Gibson called this complementarity and he said it defined these two entities as a functional pair. I think affordances are also perceptual insofar as they are not intrinsic properties of objects and environments but they're properties of those objects and environments as they are perceived by the senses and apprehended by the minds of potential users. So in this sense, affordances are subjective rather than objective, but as we've just seen, they do relate to real biophysical properties or characteristics of objects and environments, which are independent of the perceiver. But for an affordance to exist for a given individual, it's not enough that the functional interaction is theoretically possible. It actually has to be perceived. So it's not enough that a person is in fact strong enough or dexterous enough to move a given object. The potential for use has to be present in the mind of that potential user. And that's interesting because it means that the perception uh, might be triggered by having seen it done before or by having the previous experience. We'll come back to that in a moment. So affordances are experiential insofar as they can be discovered through interaction and recognized through experience. Uh, Don Norman prefers to say that affordances must be, quote, discoverable, unquote, as well as, quote, perceivable, unquote, if they are to be, quote, effective, unquote. So they have to be discoverable and perceivable in order to be what he calls an effective affordance. Bear in mind, of course, he's thinking from a design perspective. The point being that affordances can be discovered in practice, for example, by trial and error, but they can also be learned by observation and by emulation. So you can watch someone else doing something and that can give you a clue as to how it might work or it might give you the, the, the first idea of the possibility. And this makes uh, the affordances cultural or traditional in the sense that's used by Marcel Mauss in his classic definition of techniques, which he called act traditionnel efficace or traditional effective acts. So he called techniques traditional effective acts because they are passed by one individual or one generation or one cohort to the next. They're traditional in that sense that they're cultural. And the sociologist Tim Dant has picked up on this point when he observed that an affordance could be perceived through personal experience and by learning from others. He said, the affordance is not simply a fixed or physical property of the object or the environment because it is related to the human agency that perceives what it offers. Different human agents will perceive different agency in different objects, although they may learn either by trial and error or from each other, what a specific object might afford. So let's keep digging. Affordances are also relational. And Dant's account highlights the relational character of affordances, which hinges on the fact that the possibilities for material interaction are properties that emerge out of a relationship between an object or environment that has certain attributes, such as size or shape or dimensions <clears throat> or apparent weight, and an organism endowed with senses and abilities which perceives opportunities that those attributes present to it. For example, an appreciation that the objects uh, or, or the environment's size or shape 
place it within or beyond that specific organism's capacity to interact with that object. So again, it's about the relationship. <clears throat> and Don Norman says that this relational definition of affordance gives considerable difficulty to many people. We are used to thinking that properties are associated with objects, but affordance is not a property An affordance is a relationship. Whether an affordance exists depends upon the properties of both the object and the agent. So I hope that's sufficient to define what affordances are. And I think we can now think about how they arise. So to summarize some of the things I've been saying, they are qualities that arise through interaction between a user or users and an object or a collection or a network of objects or an environment. They're perceptual in the sense that they have to be perceived by a potential user, which makes them subjective. They depend not only on actual physical possibilities, but on the perception that such possibilities exist. And that can be modified by human factors, such as confidence, for instance. They're experiential. They can be discovered through interaction or by play or by tinkering. And they can be observed when others are doing these things and they can be emulated, which makes them modifiable. They can, you can change affordances by learning and through experience. Affordances are relationships between specific functional pairs but also they are relationships that are modified by structures, for example, cultural frameworks or institutional relationships. And uh, I'll come back to this in the next slide. And they're also situational. They're contextual. They, are, uh, they arise in a, uh, for a particular, out of a particular relationship in a particular time and place. And this makes them also potentially dynamic. They can change over time. For example, as somebody's skills get greater or their experience enlarges, they can see opportunities which perhaps they hadn't been aware of or which would not have existed for them until uh, their skills expanded. So it follows that the affordances of a given object or an environment will be different for different individuals and for different situations. And I can clarify this by asking a question, what is an object for? So who decides what an object is for? And there's scope here for tension, for conflict and for rivalry over who gets to define the meaning and the purpose of a technology. And this is about the relationship between designers and users. It uh, arises when you see disputes about the proper and safe use of technologies. Uh, it, it arises where you see the scope for creative and innovative uses of objects. In other words, there's a politics of technology and here I find uh, actor network theory quite useful. I don't know if any of you are familiar with actor network theory, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. And we, can, uh, we can enlarge on it perhaps. So it provides a language for thinking about the ways objects and artifacts mediate between human actors. And by mediating, they help to crystallize uh, configurations of social relationships, including unequal relationships of power and influence. So to make that more concrete, Inventors and designers and makers of technological artifacts and systems very often attempt to anticipate what their intended target audience, their intended users are like and what they should be like. And they attempt to use those objects and artifacts to enroll those other actors in their networks and to configure their relationships and also to impose a script on them or to impose a program on them to say, this is what this object is for. This is how you're supposed to use it. Here are some instructions and guidelines. There's a certain expectation about who those, who those users are and what they should be doing with these, with these artifacts and the techniques that are uh, recommended for bringing those artifacts into use. But those intended users of technology can also resist and subvert that script or that program that's been designed for them. And so that's why uh, you often see uh, struggles over, over technology, um, because there are differences of view about what the technology is for and who it's for and how it should be used. And to illustrate this a bit further, some accounts of affordance theory distinguish between uh, affordances and negative affordances or anti-affordances. And this is a way to highlight the fact that some kinds of affordance operate as constraints on agency rather than enablers of agency. They're there 
to actually restrict what you can do and not necessarily to enlarge what you can do. So what does this mean for methodology? Where should we look for affordances? <clears throat> in three places, I think. The first one is in biophysical and material interactions or relationships. Essentially, the guideline here is to consider the relationship between attributes of objects and environments, such as size, weight, dimensions, so on, relative to the capacities of individuals and groups, such as height, strength, and dexterity. And for example, the same object will likely have different affordances for, for instance, an infant, an able-bodied adult, an adult with a physical disability, and a frail elderly person. The second place to look is in symbolic and ritual interactions and relationships. So cultural institutions and norms, such as gender roles, this is key in agriculture, or relations between generations, that's another important one in, in uh, the management of, uh, of agriculture and, and in small scale um, farming households, and also performances of other identities, such as caste, ethnicity, sexuality, etc strongly influence the scope of people's entitlements and their freedoms to engage with technologies of different kinds. For example, in a given society, the freedom of an individual to use certain objects, such as types of machines or clothing or modes of transport or articles of furniture, can be conditioned by social rules and institutions and there can be sanctions imposed for transgression. And this means that the affordances of a given object could be different for a young woman compared to her classmate of a different ethnicity or compared to her own mother or an adult male or a priest. So a good example of this in uh, agriculture, in rice cultivation, which I've studied and particularly in South Asia, there are certain kinds of farming operations that are perceived to be men's work or women's work and certain kinds of tools which are considered to be largely for the use of men rather than women. And these are cultural institutions which are shaping the affordances and they come from the domain of symbolic and ritual interactions. And finally, there's a political economy angle. There are social and economic relationships where I think we can find affordances. So things like wealth, income, consumption, jobs, livelihoods, these are all important shapers of human relations and they distribute economic capacity, which is power. And by doing so, they determine the affordances of objects and environments for different individuals and groups. So for example, a rich business owner is likely to perceive many more opportunities in his environment than a homeless rough sleeper. And that person will enjoy a much greater capacity to exploit those opportunities. The more important point is that people whose position within uh, an economic institution endows them with greater power can have a large influence on how affordances are configured for a range of other people. So let me illustrate that, for example, by talking about the personality of someone like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, who has a very substantial capacity to shape not only how technical artifacts and systems are designed and how they're supposed to work, but also how and where they're manufactured, um, who, uh, who they're marketed to, to whom they're available, the price at which they're sold, and so on. And I guess some of you may be thinking, when am I going to talk a bit more about agriculture? Well, here's an example of Francois Sigaud talking about affordances in agriculture. And he's talking about crops that represent different affordances. He says affordances are defined as environmental resources for behavior. A flat and smooth surface affords physical opportunities that are put to use by a skater. The fact that wheat and rice produce both edible grains and straw, whereas reeds and rushes produce only usable straw, and maize or sorghum only edible grains points to different affordances. And this gives us a whole new appreciation of what agriculture is. The purposeful search for and exploitation of affordances in the environment, which allow us to produce goods that we value, especially food, but also fiber and other pro uh, uh, products. So in some of my previous work, I first studied the system of rice intensification, and um, we tried to bring a technographic approach, and this table tries to express the difference that that made. So when we first came along, uh, at the time, there was a right old row going on about the system of rice intensification, but it was largely based on whether or not SRI was really better or worse in terms of pro productivity or or accessibility or, or 
uh, or the costs of production or profitability uh, for small scale farmers. And you had supporters of SRI who were saying that uh, this set of techniques is more productive and um, you'll get higher yields and more profits and more food security. And you had other people disputing that and saying, well, it's very labor intensive or it has partic particular choke points during the season. And so they were arguing about it, but they were arguing based on a rather what, I, what I've labeled here as the conventional approach to understanding SRI. And in the left-hand column, uh, they had a picture of what SRI is, which was based on a technology package of cultivation methods about the transplanting of single seedlings when they were very young with a spacing distance, which was normally expressed as 25 centimeters. And the analytical approach and methods was based on the concept of adoption. Farmers were seen either to adopt or not adopt this package of practices. And in order to find those adopters and non-adopters and to find out what impact SRI had had, you used survey methods to find, it, find the adopters, find the non-adopters and the disadopters, and then measure the outcomes that they had. And how SRI was conceived to work was all about these new cultivation practices that enabled rice plants to express their full genetic or physiological potential. And cultivators were barely in the picture. They were just there to arrange everything to suit the rice plant's physiology. And the function of SRI was about healthier individual plants producing more tillers and panicles and higher yields. And the effect was about higher grain yields. But the technographic approach is much more actually about observing what people were doing. It said, well, SRI is clearly a thing. It's a phenomenon out there. There are people doing something with SRI and evidently some people are prepared to take a public stand and say that they find it advantageous for some reason. So how can you understand that? And instead of going out and saying, well, we know what SRI is, it's a technical package which is supposed to produce these higher yields. We said, well, there's something new going on here it's about novel cultivation practices with new and changed techniques, tools, operations, tasks, sodalities, etc. And the analytical approach is much more about observational and ethnographic methods. It's about studying individual operations within a process, noting how they were performed, by whom, with what kinds of coordination and so on. And how SRI was working was an empirical question. SRI arrives as a proposition and then what do farmers do with it? So we were recognizing that the cultivators were not just arranging the field to suit the rice plant, but they were making decisions based on their human purposes. And again, the function of SRI to be discovered empirically, what are the cultivators and their communities doing with SRI? And the effects were not just about higher yields or lower yields or whether it was more or less profitable, it was about complex and situated socio-technical reconfiguration of new skills being learned, new tasks being performed, new roles created and redistributed and so on. It was about relationships. <clears throat> and uh, one of our PhD students did an interesting study of SRI in three different um, villages in Uttarakhand in Northern India. And it illustrated really vividly how the introduction of SRI resolves into very different local configurations, depending on how people work through to find a solution based on the proposition that they've been given. And it's shaped by the local agroecology, by the history and, and embedded institutions of existing systems and practices, based on socioeconomics, on factors like gender, age, caste, and so on, geography, relations with technical support, and so on. So in each of the three different villages, there were three different solutions, different households engaging with SRI in different ways. They weren't always following the script that they'd been given. There were issues of infidelity and how the script was transmitted to them. And there were deviations in practice by the people on the ground who rewrote the script. So essentially this has led to uh, myself and other colleagues, and we're not the only ones of course, but to really questioning the concepts of technology transfer and adoption. Because based on all of the thinking which I've been talking about in this presentation, Technology is not something that people have or they lack or something that's transferred as discrete units from one place or community to another. Technology is something people do and make. And so when technology moves, it's not simply transferred, but initially it's communicated as a proposition. And if it's to be, quote, successful, whatever the index of success may be, it has to be remade on the ground in situ by the local practitioners. And it involves a local reconfiguration of social and technical practices
and social material relations. Okay, I should probably stop there and I feel like I'm probably going over time, but uh, we still have part three to go. Peter. Uh, thank you, that, that's helped. I really liked the Pfaffenberger uh, definition of affordances. Uh, I was wondering, following on from the uh, SRI example you just gave, uh, I would think one of the, the main drives for the conventional study into this would be to decide whether we want to design public policies that now encourage people to, to use SRI practices. Uh, and then I'm sure uh, you and other researchers who studied it from that angle uh, ran into the problem, okay, but who actually uses the entire panel of SRI? And when I read up on this, I always found that as, as a big caveat, yeah, but people don't actually do it exactly like uh, the, the best practices would, uh, would suggest. Would you think that with uh, using a affordance model, a better way would be to look at, okay, what do people use after being exposed to, or, uh, to, the, uh, to this technology package? So after you've done the communication, after you've explained to people, uh, if you do this and this and this, then you'll have high yields. Then you look at what do people actually do and you measure that and decide based on that, whether it's a good uh, uh, technology package to, to endorse or to promote. Yeah, Peter, you've you've um, you've immediately leapt ahead to the next section again. Sorry, that's, uh, that. So so you've um, yeah, that's that's exactly what I would say. I think you know uh, one of the things that is important to do is to kind of let go of this preconception about what the outcome state is supposed to be, and also to appreciate that um, you may not be in command or in, in, you may not have a full picture of what it is that people might or might not find useful on the ground. Um, or what their motives are for engaging. So this doesn't necessarily mean that it's just sort of a free for all of, you know, whatever people do on the ground is completely fine. But I think it's, uh, it means that we need to appreciate that uh, uh, the decisions that people make on the ground are not under our full control and that it's helpful. You know, the key problem with adoption is if you go out and, um, um, which I'm, I, I may as well talk about here because it, it, it's relevant to the next section is, if you have this preconception about what the outcome state is supposed to be, then all you can do is go and look for people who look like adopters and people who look like non-adopters and people who may be adopted and then disadopted. Um, but it means that you're possibly blind to other things that could be going on. So for example, there may have been new relationships formed which have had a positive effect on farmers' confidence or on their exchange of knowledge and information, which could, means that your intervention could be making a good and positive difference. Um, but because you're looking for adoption as an evaluator, you're missing out on those things. It's equally possible that you could be getting uh, um, diagnosis in, in the opposite direction, that um, you find that great uh, farmers adopted exactly uh, what we recommended and we, you know, 40% of the farmers that we targeted are now doing this new system. But along the way, you might actually have undermined their social relations or their trust or their their confidence or, or their resilience. Um, so it's about having a more open-ended um, mm. perception of what people have done after they've been exposed to this thing. All right, that's that's interesting. Uh, perhaps in a similar vein, uh, Barbara Harris-White -White is asking whether you could talk through the uh, technographics of the de-adoption uh, of SRI in what I assume is Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. And what's the role of costs and prices in the process? Um, gosh, that's uh, that sounds like a, a large question. Um, uh, how would you talk about that from a from a technographic point of view or, or through the affordances? I mean, I think it's clear that that when you're thinking about things uh, through the lens of affordances, the the kind of standard economic questions that you would typically ask about how much it costs to do this thing or what are the opportunity costs um, or what are the what's the balance between the the costs of your inputs and the and the profitability of your outputs those questions don't um, become irrelevant but I think they become less um, kind of all-consuming if the question is about you know, has, has SRI really stuck around? I think the answer is that, uh, unfortunately, 
that we're not able to go to India at the moment. But um, I don't see so much SRI on the ground. But I think part of the reason is that, um, you know, the, the SRI phenomenon has already um, sort of diffused and done its work and affected the practices, not only of farmers, but also of NGOs, and it's created new relationships. So there has been an effect there, but it's not necessarily the agronomic um, performance of, of the standard suite of practices that, uh, say, the SRI promoting community have, have hoped for, or that the, um, the uh, sort of the, the rice establishment feared. I don't know if that answers Barbara's question, but maybe we can come back to it at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So should, I, should I carry on? I think so. I'll try and go as, as quickly as possible for this last bit. So in this um, last section, I'm going to be um, talking about uh, going beyond adoption and uh, talking about this new framework for thinking about technological change. So bearing in mind what I've said in the first two parts of the presentation um, and building up through those to trying to reconceptualize uh, what goes on during a process of technological change and what that means for both the agencies that are trying to stimulate technological change and for uh, researchers who are trying to understand it and um, NGOs and field practitioners who are trying to facilitate it. How could it potentially change the way we go about our business? So <clears throat> the, I'm going to be referring here to a paper which came out in 2019 um, by myself and uh, some colleagues from IDS and also from CIMITS, the um, International Centre for Maize and Wheat Improvement. Um, called Rethinking Technological Change in Smallholder Agriculture that came out in Outlook on Agriculture in 2019. And we proposed this new framework, which has these four elements that you see on the slide, the four aspects of technological change, propositions, encounters, dispositions, and responses. And I want to say before I start talking about them that though there is an implicit uh, sequence, um, it's not actually a set of discrete phases and it's not a linear model or even a cyclical model uh, that proceeds purely from one step to the next. Um, I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. But what we proposed was that <clears throat> when a, uh, a, a technology is proposed um, by the way, I should say that what we're, what we're really talking about here is those instances where a new technology or an innovation is deliberately introduced to a community um, by some external agency, which wants to encourage farmers to adopt this thing. So we're not just talking, uh, we're not talking specifically about the possibility that new affordances or, or propositions could be perceived by farmers or communities using their own agency, but that also happens. This model is really addressed to um, the agencies and the people who are trying and who are responsible and have some accountability for trying to induce or stimulate technological change or produce uh, through technology, produce benefits for um, people on the ground. So we use the term propositions to convey the idea that the, the innovation or the technology arrives initially as a concept, as an idea as a suggestion, or perhaps you might say an invitation. It's an opportunity. Um, it could be something perceived in the environment or it could be something deliberately introduced. And that's what I'm talking about here. And we said that this proposition generally includes three components. There are some biophysical resources, uh, tools, equipment, energy, built infrastructure, living organisms, fertilizers, pesticides, and very often, uh, in agriculture, the proposition includes improved seed varieties of some kind, but it could also be fertilizers, it could be pesticides or other agrochemicals. The second element of the proposition is a set of methods, techniques, practices, procedures, protocols. And generally speaking, that comes with a set of instructions or guidelines or uh, um, uh, a set of techniques which need to be learned or maybe a schedule, a calendar when operations should be performed. So this is part of the proposition. It's about, first of all, these, uh, these inputs, these artifacts or these materials, these resources, 
and some techniques or practices or te uh, uh, methods for bringing them into use. But and, and so far so conventional, but I think very often what you see in um, interventions is that there's an implicit and very often it's not explicit uh, third component, which is a proposed mode of engagement in agricultural production. In other words, what's being addressed is the suggestion that, and this is very typical, that you should be operating more as a commercially oriented farmer, that you should be trying to produce cash crops for the market in order to improve your cash income. But it could also be that you should be pursuing farming in a cooperative with your neighbours, or that you should be pursuing farming for self-sufficiency, or that you should be pursuing farming which is more uh, uh, um, environmentally friendly or sustainable, etc. So there's a proposed mode of engagement. Encounters are the occasion or the arena where the proposition is brought to someone's attention. It can be deliberately orchestrated and it may be through the agency of an external actor such as a sales representative, an extension officer, but it can also be through the agency of a farmer who notices an opportunity in the landscape. And this is um, what the economists talk about as the spillover effects, for example, where um, a farmer who is participating in some kind of a project has a neighbor who observes what they're doing on their land and then starts to learn from it, or starts to explore that and, and possibly copy it and possibly learn from it. The important thing about encounters is that what makes a difference here is not just the quantity, for example, counting up the number of demonstration plots, which we very often see in annual reports or evaluations, how many farmers were exposed through this demonstration. It also calls attention to the quality of those encounters and the relationships between the farmers and the extension people or the other sources of information that they might be relying upon. Dispositions. Um, this is where the relationality is really visible, I think. The point being that there are potentially an array of multiple different dispositions for different actors, different households, different individuals, different communities, different villages. And these dispositions emerge relationally for different agents uh, in relation to the proposition and shaped by the, uh, the quality of the encounter. They're situational, they're opportunistic in relation to time. And to try and explain this, I'm going to read a quote from uh, some of my own work. So the theory of affordances suggests that the variety of dispositions is shaped simultaneously by the individual characteristics and circumstances of people and households, by the dynamics and quality of the encounter, and by features of the proposition. Each of the three components of the proposition, the material, the practical, and the relational, may create a specific set of affordances for different individuals and groups. Combinations of cultural, economic, biophysical, spatial, temporal, and other factors shape perceptions of a proposition. They generate a spectrum of multiple unique dispositions among the variety of people and households that encounter the proposition. And they determine whether and in what ways a proposition is perceived as a relevant and interesting opportunity for each individual decision maker. In other words, the disposition is all about whether someone is positively or negatively or indifferently disposed towards the proposition. And we might think about this using a nice framework, uh, which I've drawn from a paper by Michi and colleagues, the behavior change wheel. Uh, it's a combination of the capability, the opportunity and the motivation to engage. And I think that's quite a useful way of thinking about the dispositions towards this proposition after it has been encountered. And finally, responses. So the key point, I think, one of the things that we wanted to introduce with this framework was, and which has been mentioned uh, earlier, is that the spectrum or the array of potential responses that a, an agent might make once they perceive an opportunity or encounter a proposition is that, uh, potentially wide and diverse. So it opens up the possibility that there are many different ways in which an agent might choose to respond to the opportunity that's been presented to them. And there's also the potential here for the intervention that's being made by an NGO or by an agricultural extension um, system, potential for that intervention to generate effects that were unintended or unanticipated. And the thin concept of adoption is really inadequate to capture most of these potential responses. And 
uh, to try to sum up the, the, the types of different responses or, or to systematize them a little bit, I've come up with the terms ignore, in other words, do nothing, explore, check it out, try it for yourself, see how it works, or even deplore, resist, subvert, campaign against, encourage your neighbors not to get involved, steer clear. So ignore, explore, or deplore. So affordances are at the heart of understanding the relationships among these four aspects of technological change. The propositions present affordances to different people and groups in different contexts. The perception of the affordances is shaped by the nature of the encounters, both quality and quantity, and by the dispositions of the households that encounter the proposition. The dispositions are shaped by the household composition, by the capabilities within the household, by the resources at the household's disposal, by the confidence, by the aspirations, by the intentions and values of the household, as well as by the relations to the proposition and to the people making the proposition, which uh, are uh, those relationships emerge through the types of encounters that they have. And the responses are expressions of how people and groups seek to exploit the affordances that they perceive. So let me just reiterate that even though there is a sort of implicit sense that you would move from a proposition which is encountered and then you would have people's emerging dispositions and then you would have a series of responses but actually each of these aspects modifies the others and there are potential feedback loops and interconnections between these four aspects which makes it not a linear model or even a cyclical model although you could potentially use it that way perhaps as a design tool all right, so what does this mean for um, our understanding or our, our evaluation of technological change, both ex ante and ex post? In place of counting adopters of a technology, I think we need to be guided by the affordances to explore what happens for different people and groups when they're exposed to a new opportunity. I think we need to let go of preconceptions about what a technology is supposed to be for, Instead, I think we need to rely on empirical observation or engagement with farmers and, and communities uh, to show how these technologies are being used or how they're perceived by whom and what they're being used for and how they're being used. Observe what people actually do. Explore how a pathway of change is being shaped. For example, if people are not engaging with technology in the way you expect, study that, learn from it. If people are not taking up your new technology, explore why the affordances might be irrelevant or negative for that person or group. Study the ramifications of a technological change intervention in non-deterministic ways, with fewer preconceptions about what you think the technology is for, or how you think it ought to be used, or how you think it ought to work, or what you think the, the impacts and outcomes ought to be. But the framework, I think, can also be useful for thinking about and designing your intervention ex ante. Think about your proposition. How is it supposed to appeal to your target audience? How accessible is it? How compatible is it, is it with an existing setup? How will the target audience encounter it? How might they perceive and respond to it? How will encounters be organized? How will they be orchestrated? What kind of relations will they have uh, between, for example, trainers and farmers or uh, among farmers themselves? So uh, that's the end of my presentation and not before time. So I hope we still have enough time for a discussion before the end. I'm just going to add some, sorry, these thanks and appreciation to various people who uh, have in various ways influenced my thinking uh, or um, commented on previous versions of uh, uh, my writings on this topic. And I'll end finally with my coordinates uh, in case anybody wants to follow up afterwards. Peter. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, there's a question that's just come up from uh, Floris uh, Burgess uh, saying, as you argued that promoters of certain technological in innovations should not be uh, so much concerned with adoption, but rather with uh, technology as an affordance, for example, in changed uh, social relationships, do you also see a greater role for them in managing the new social realities uh, a technology as affordance generates? Is it uh, possible to manage that at all? Um, I'll just open the chat box so I can read the question. Um, so Floris, when you say 
do you also see a greater role for them in managing the new social realities? You're talking about the promoters of a technological innovation, is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. Okay. Um, and and uh, Floris, what do you mean by managing those, managing the new social, social realities? What are you driving right. at there? Right. Um, you were sort of arguing that um, the, conventional, the conventional approach uh, of um, uh, people implementing certain technologies is to look at um, adoption, right? So you have a technology, you think about it as a good way of doing things, then we go and we promote it, then we um, uh, test to what extent it's been adopted. And for that reason, we don't have much attention for, you know, what it does with social relationships and so on. Um, so if we think of technologies not so much as you know things that do a certain thing to um, the world, but rather as affordances, things that have relationships with um, um, the people using them and so on, um, that also opens up space to, as you say, pay attention to what a technology that a technology does with relationships. Um, but then, if we no longer test what a technology does in terms of its adoption, but also what it does in terms of relationship, we should also respond to that, right? That's sort of the natural outcome of that analysis. If we see that we have negative side effects, for example, our um, technological invention led to new inequalities and so on, we were able to trace that through thinking of technology as an affordance. Um, then I suppose that we should also sort of pay more attention as to how we can manage these side effects. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it does mean that uh, it raises questions about the accountability uh, and the responsibility of the agencies that are trying to introduce new technologies. Um, and that's why I talked a little bit about how you might use this uh, lens or this framework for thinking about uh, an intervention ex ante as well as evaluating it ex post. So it's partly about the design and thinking being, being careful and being reflexive and, and being diligent about collecting information about your target audience or, you know, who you're trying to help and what their needs are and what their preferences are and so on. And then also, once you've, uh, you know, charged into the situation and brought your new proposition and said, we think that this is really going to work for you, to, uh, to pay attention to what then happens and be alert to the possibility that things might be going maybe off course or that... Uh, Maybe the outcomes, maybe there's some important feedback for you in your technological design uh, that means that you need to, to go back to the drawing board and, and reintroduce the, the proposition. So, um, yeah, I think there's, a, a, there's an ethical dimension to it, but also there's an effectiveness dimension. If we want to, um, if we want to be more effective in producing good outcomes for uh, the communities that uh, international development aid is supposed to help, then we should... Uh, we can use these, this, this conceptual framework, I think, to, to try to do that better. That sounds great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Natasha has a hand up. Natasha, would you like to ask? Natasha, you're muted. Hi, Dominic. Yeah, I thought it'd be quicker to say it rather than type all out. Um, thank you so much. It's really interesting. Um, and I've been working on um, innovations and adoptions in East and West Africa for a while around climate change um, for, for farmers and uh, a, a, a wide variety of those. And I, I've noticed that in, in the kind of project conceptualization, it's very infrequent for there to be funding allocated to what I'd call a proper understanding of the kind of things that, that you're talking about. Um, and, uh, and I, I think it'd be interesting to hear from you kind of how, how you found a response to these kinds of approaches in reality and in, in development funding, because I can see it's absolutely critical. It completely makes sense when you talk about it. Um, clearly, those innovations need to be seen as a kind of um, agency related um, issue, but um, that's not how they are commonly perceived. So I, I would I'd just like to hear a little bit from you about that. Mm. Natasha, I, I, I really, um, yeah, really important. And I'm glad that you've raised this and I'm not going to pretend that I've got the, a brilliant answer to it. I mean, 
I, I ended the presentation with uh, thinking about the, the ways in which this could be applied, but we really haven't got as far as kind of operationalizing it. And, and I'm going to share that uh, we've made, I think it's three different attempts now to raise money to sort of, uh, to do a kind of experimental project to see how this might be operationalized. I mean, can it be converted into some practical and useful and affordable tools that would be useful to agencies in the field that are trying to design and implement projects and also to understand the difference that they're making? Um, and we need practical tools and affordable tools and accessible tools, but um, does this provide that? I can imagine that uh, it does, but I'd love to take it to that next step. But then you're up against, as I think you hinted at, and I'd love to hear your perspective on this, the idea that I think um, a lot of uh, development agencies are quite a sort of, uh, they're wedded to a certain technology and to a certain set of expectations. And they like to be able to say, you know, we've disseminated our technology to X number of people. Um, and it's a nice measurable indicator that you, they can take to their annual report or to their, uh, to their other stakeholders and show how effective they're being. And I think if you, if you perceive that your job is to disseminate technology and you're convinced that the technology is what matters, then coming along and saying, actually, you need to look at the, the, the people that you're trying to help as, as agents and decision makers, it's a different lens and a different approach. It's starting from a different point in the process. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, Natasha, I'd love to, I'd love to hear a bit more about your experiences. Um, but I know there are other people who have questions coming up. I'm happy to come back, um, Peter, but that's up to you as, because <laughs> I, I can see nitty has got a question as well. Uh, yes, I think, I think Barbara might've been first. Uh, uh, Dominic, do you want to respond to Barbara's question from the chat? So yes, I can see that Barbara says, uh, if we accept the first three processes through which adoption can be construed, how can the response be confined to decisions, ignore, ignore, explore, without reference to market institutions, finance, capital implications for labor hiring, et cetera, how these factors have loomed large in the conventional theories of adoption incorporated into this technographic framework. I ask because I imagine that the mindset of policy people will privilege these kinds of institutions. Yeah, I think that's uh, very probably true, <laughs> Barbara. Um, so, <clears throat> I wouldn't, I, I certainly wouldn't advocate that you ignore, uh, so, sorry, that you, uh, that you pay no attention to market institutions such as finance capital, implications for labor hiring, et cetera. I mean, one of the reasons why I think affordances is useful and recognizing that affordances will be different for different uh, people in, the, in a rural community is that the affordances of technology for a farmer or a landowner may very well be different than the affordances for a laborer uh, or uh, a landless laborer, someone who's selling their labor um, to work on other people's farms. And if you think about the the capabilities and the opportunities that households have to engage with technology, then definitely access to credit, access to finance will be a part of that um, sort of estimation of whether this opportunity is something that's relevant and interesting to this household. So um, I guess what I'm saying is I think it's not that those, uh, I guess what you'd call kind of more traditional or more uh, established ways of looking at uh, adoption decisions are irrelevant, but I think this this lens, this perspective, enlarges the the the, the spectrum of things that we should be paying attention to. I hope that answers the question, Barbara. I don't know if you want to come back on the microphone, maybe. I'm just conscious of the time. So unless Barbara wants to urgently follow up, I would like to give Nitya the chance to ask her question as well. Sure. Uh, thanks, Dominique. I actually wanted to ask, I think uh, coming back to agriculture itself and agricultural technology, I think one of the areas, particularly the CGIAR, I think institutions recognizing that this adoption was not so straightforward, I think went into a whole range of participatory kind of approaches. So participatory breathing, particularly. And uh, I don't know how that kind of sits 
with this uh, those sort of four blocks because in a sense I was just thinking as you were speaking that participatory breathing has some kind of a proposition some encounter uh, uh, probably disposition when you're doing sort of trials on farmers farmers fields or selection and so on and I I mean is that one way potentially of kind of operationalizing uh, this framework uh, yeah, definitely, Nitya. I think it is, and I think it would be really interesting uh, to um, to kind of use this kind of framework to think about what goes on during a participatory technology development process or participatory plant breeding process. Um, and I think one interesting question to ask would be: Okay, so you have these participatory approaches, but what is the what's the proposition being made when you're inviting? Uh, farmers or, or uh, local communities to get involved in a technology development process. Is it a proposition that says, okay, we've already got a preconceived idea that what you need is a better bean technology. Uh, and so that's what we want to talk about. And whereas the community might be thinking, well, you know, better beans would be okay, but actually we're more concerned about some other issue um, that uh, is perhaps more pressing and more urgent or more kind of intractable or, or a chronic problem for us in this area. And if that's not what the intervention is offering, then there's kind of an intrinsic uh, sort of boundary around if you're talking about bean technology and really the, the major concerns of the community are on some other factor or on the opportunity costs of investing more in beans. Uh, whereas they may prefer to be doing some kind of off farm income generating um, so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's about thinking about what is the proposition being made and how relevant it is and useful and, um, accessible to the community that you're trying to help. Does that, does that come close to answering the question? Thanks, uh, Dominic. Can I ask a question, Peter, if there are no others, um, which, is, <laughs> um, which is not quite so technical, but it's, uh, Dominic, you, so you mentioned that there's a sort of a need to test some of these things empirically now. Now, of course, um, across some of our work, some of our projects, there'll be projects that might have themes that are very relevant to affordances and these kind of ideas. Um, what, would it, what would it really take, do you think, to start testing these things empirically? And is it something that we could start putting into projects um, to sort of Back up this this theory and test it in, in a sort of collaborative collaborative sort of kind of way. Yeah, I mean, I I'm I'm wide open to uh, to finding partners and collaborators who would be interested in exploring this idea because you know I'm de I'm definitely not I'm kind of conscious I, even you know when designing and delivering a presentation like this that there are there are people who come uh, and and make their kind of grand scheme and say this is my new model or my new my new framework and then uh, they spend possibly the rest of their careers banging on about it and I'm, I'm absolutely not interested in just saying okay we we've got this fabulous new framework but I'd love to see genuinely to explore uh, whether it's useful and practical and can be applied um, in the field and I think what's interesting about it is that you can um, if you start to unpack what goes into a proposition, what, what counts about an encounter, uh, how do you understand dispositions, how can you detect different kinds of responses, then there's a lot of unpacking that needs to be done. And I think that it would be really interesting to do that work. So if there are kind of existing projects and programs out there where people are interested in exploring uh, how the intervention is working or um, maybe how to design an intervention in a way which is more, um, sensitive to these kinds of concerns about the agencies of farmers. I mean, I'd be absolutely delighted to, to talk with people further, definitely. Brilliant. We've got one more question from Anthony Pickles. Anthony, do you... uh, hello there, can you hear me all right? Yes. I'm doing this on a phone, so. Great, um, I, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask whether, like how optimistic or pessimistic, like your framework allows you to be about the, implementation of a affordance centered approach to, to implementing agricultural changes or any other kind of changes, simply because the, uh, it, it, it strikes me that, you know, the, the profit motive and the, um, and the, the tools at hand for people who initiate development uh, initiatives are, as you say, technologically driven. So, they, so 
they're they're sort of you know they're they're afforded the opportunity to to intervene technologically, um, and that's always going to sort of shape their way of um, uh, of 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 developing a new uh, a new perspective on it. What they lack is the ability to to appreciate other people's affordances because they are not afforded that ability uh, because of the way that, you know, disciplines are set up and the way these interventions are funded. So I wondered, like, you know, maybe you even need a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, a different, um, you know, a different, to, to produce not even, a di not, a, not a different set of tools, but like a different set of, uh, of tools for tools for, for, the, um, for this kind of intervention. So just a question. Yeah, uh, thanks. I was interested uh, or intrigued that you put it in terms of, um, of, of optimism or pessimism about the potential. Because um, I do think that certainly if you look at, uh, say, commercial technology providers, they clearly have a vested interest in promoting their particular package or their particular inputs to say, you know, we want to sell more of this stuff and, and make money out of it. So um, I, I expect it's it's this kind of a, approach is not likely to be appealing to those kinds of people. But if you're looking at public agricultural research and extension, um, I think there's a much stronger uh, imperative to, to try to proceed responsibly and not necessarily be wedded to um, a particular technology package and disseminating it in a very standardized, rigid way. It should be more about trying to understand the uh, you know, one of the reasons why uh, we felt it was important to write the paper was that there, there is potentially an array or a spectrum of different uh, kinds of people and households and that have different capabilities, different motivations, different priorities, and a range of different ways that they might choose to respond. And if you're only thinking about, say, you know, a farmer that you've preconceived as being a commercially oriented, profit oriented um, a farmer who's running their farm as a business, then you're, there's a whole load of other people who could definitely benefit from, uh, from some help and support who are being ignored and neglected. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that comes some way to answering your question, Nancy, but, but uh, yeah, maybe it's something we could follow up. Great, thank you, uh, Dominic. Very good. And thank you all for attending. Uh, I don't see any further questions, which is great because we've just gone over time. Uh, so just before we end, I'd like to uh, invite you all to the next uh, uh, seminar we'll be organizing, which is not for a while. This is on the 29th of June. Uh, and this will be together with the John Innes Foundation annual lecture. And we are very excited to welcome uh, soil scientist, Professor Ratan Mal, uh, who won the World Food Prize just last year, uh, who will be speaking about his vision for uh, uh, sustainable soil use in agriculture. Uh, so, yes, thank you, uh, Dominic, and thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Uh, I hope there will be a recording of this available fairly soon on the NIST website, and I hope to see you again at the end of June. Bye-bye. My thanks to everybody as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.